Let's take a look at what a long position is. In a long position, uh, you have a couple of different things. You have what people might call investing in a stock where you're going to plan to hold on to it. And what you're really after is a dividend and long-term growth of the stock over time. You're going to survive the dips. And this would be very much like being a, a landlord real estate investor saying, look, I'm going to just hang on to this house. And I'm going to let the ups and downs of the real estate market go. I'm not going to freak out a lot. Uh, and I'm just going to collect rent as I go, and that's what I'm going to do. And so I have a lot of faith in the real estate market, so I'm going to hold these properties, and, and off I go. Well, this is very much true with, with many stocks. You look at Warren Buffett having bought uh, the Coca-Cola in the 80s. And so you got, you know, 80s, 90s, 2000s. You know, for almost for 30, 40 years, he's had that stock. And uh, he just enjoys those dividends, as we spoke earlier. Other people flip houses. And uh, it isn't to say that, that I haven't seen Kenny and, and my friend Than hold all their real estate forever. I've seen Kenny sell the bottom third of his portfolio when it's not performing to have cash to buy new. So it isn't like there's a, there's a uh, one or the other. It isn't like you have to say, well, I'm going to either buy and hold until I die and never sell. Or I'm going to trade every minute in high frequency trading. There's every range in between. And I think the best answer is not to be dogmatic. Uh, Steve Jobs had a great quote. He says, don't be trapped by dogma of people who say, this is how it should be all the time. Because when you do that, you discount what the future may hold. And there might be a time where I sell all my stocks. Uh, I don't know what the future holds. To be dogmatic in the area of finance very, very, very dangerous, in my opinion, to say, oh, this is good and this is bad all of the time. Well, now you're trapped within those rules. And if circumstances change uh, to where those rules don't work anymore, uh, boy, you're going to be in trouble. So do not be trapped by dogma. Listen to guys like Ben Graham. Listen to guys like Buffett. Listen to guys like Soros and Cuban and Kiyosaki and Merrill and all these guys. But don't be dogmatic about it, in my opinion. So there's my dogma, don't be dogmatic, <laughs> which means <laughs> that's an interesting paradox. That means that to not be dogmatic, you'd follow that dogma, which means you are dogmatic. Isn't that crazy paradox? So trading a stock, um, this is where I'm planning on buying low and selling high, right? Buying low and selling high. One's going to increase my cash flow. One is going to increase the amount of net worth I have. Uh, and if I sell the asset, um, you know, that's, it is different. If you look at that statement of cash flow, uh, remember that we can have cash flowing in from the sale of an asset, right? Remember the statement of cash flow had operations, it had, uh, you know, assets, and it also had debt, you know, or what they call finance. And so you can absolutely justify that as cash flow. I'm not going to mince words and, you know, apples and oranges. We're just a beginning course here. Don't want to get too technical. Um, capital gain strategies. Is there room for both of these? Could you? Do you have to choose one or the other? There is room for both of these. In fact, you know, there's an interesting line in the uh, in the book, The Intelligent Investor. We could go take a look at that. I I absolutely love this book. Um, you know, the, the, by Benjamin Graham, the intelligent investor, absolutely love it. And the, the first part of this book, the first chapter really deals with speculation, you know, speculating on price movement as opposed to investing in more as, as a business owner. And, uh, a lot of people think that, um, that means dogmatically that we never do this at all. Um, he acknowledges that this book is really based more on this approach over here than this one. But there's an interesting line in here that I and many other people have highlighted um, that talk about this. There is intelligent speculation, which might be over here speculating on the price going up or trading the stock. And there's intelligent investing uh, coming over here and holding something. Both can be done intelligently. Um, but there are many ways in which speculation may be unintelligent. Of these, the foremost are, so it's more than three, but here's the foremost. Number one speculating when you think you're investing. So we really shouldn't confuse these two ideas, right? And, and see them as one and the same. Uh, we should be very distinct in, in understanding them. 
Number two, speculating seriously instead of as a pastime, and this is really important, where you lack proper and knowledge and skill for it. So it really is about education. A person who wants to play this game over here will definitely want to learn some fundamental and technical analysis. And this is the most important one, and we're going to talk about this in, uh, in the risk management section, that risking more money in the speculation the person can really uh, afford to lose. You know, we want to have preservation of capital, right? Um, you know, a non-professional operating on margin uh, should recognize he is speculating, right? And and all this type of stuff. So, you know, hot stocks, you can tell there's there's an intelligent way to do almost everything and an unintelligent way to do almost everything. So there is intelligent speculation and there is intelligent investing if you want to use those terms. Now, I don't like the term trading and investing maybe be different, but I do like the definition between speculating because here we're definitely speculating and that's why they call it a spec home in real estate, right? Speculation home. We're going to buy this home speculating that we can sell it. And we never had uh, an intention to rent it. We never had an intention to cash flow it. We wanted to buy it low and sell it high. Fine. Um, so that's, that's good words from Benjamin Graham. Very good words from, whoop, from, uh, from Benjamin Graham. So let's begin a discussion of, of long stocks. Let's go back into theater mode. And we talked about uh, Buffett's incredible returns in terms of his dividend on Coke because his cost basis was so low. And let's take a look at Coca-Cola for a minute. You know, you could be a shareholder of this stock or any others, just like uh, others. So we're going to talk about going long and just some basic information about a stock from a fundamental standpoint. If you're going to own something, it makes sense to go through the first pillar, which is fundamentals. And so let's look at this, some common things to look at. How many shares are available, or excuse me, how many shares has this been cut up into? So right now the Coca-Cola company is a pie that has been, uh, that has been cut up into 4.27 billion shares. So this is a massive company with many, 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 many owners now. It isn't like Mr. Coke uh, now owns it. He went public. He said, hey, who wants to buy a share of my company? And after many, many splits and many, many changes, there's now uh, you know, 4.27 billion pieces of this pie. Now, what is the difference between the shares outstanding and the flow? Just a little education here, just a little bit of nomenclature or jargon to, to, uh, to, to help us understand. Well, what the float means is those are shares that could be traded. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's say, uh, for example, what is, it, what is a share that cannot be traded? Let's say that I'm the chief financial officer of Coca-Cola, and they pay me a salary, but they also pay me a bonus as part of my income in shares of stock. And so they say, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll give you some shares of stock or create shares of stock or or uh, what have you, or transfer shares of stock to you. But these would be most likely what we call restricted shares, meaning that I would not be allowed to trade them. Often when you're an insider or an officer, or uh, for whatever reason, you can be given shares or acquire shares that are re restricted in nature, meaning, look, you can't just sell them off right now. You have to hold them for a vesting period. So the float is the amount of shares that are unrestricted that could be traded right now. Now, of course, uh, a guy like Warren Buffett, who is the largest shareholder uh, represented in green in the pie graph down there, uh, he's probably not going to liquidate all his shares at once, right? Um, so you can look at the volume and, and find out you know, how many shares on average are exchanged. It's nowhere close to $3.84 billion, right, in this stock. It has a relatively low number of uh, relative to its float of, of volume being bought and sold. The insiders hold less than 1% of this. And it's nice to know uh, when insiders trade. And you can actually, they ha if an insider, meaning someone on the inside of this company with knowledge, uh, buys or sells, they have to report that to the SEC. So if you see a lot of insider buying, uh, that's kind of a nice idea. 
if an insider does this without, or you have knowledge on the inside without disclosing it, you would be uh, uh, liable for what we call insider trading. Insider trading is legal as long as you declare uh, what you know, or declare what you're doing. Right? Um, very, very important. Uh, percent held by institutions, just under seventy percent of this is held by institutions right here, which is a big deal. Uh, the, the amount of people that are short this stock are very, very small, only 28 million. So most people's opinion is, is that it's going up. Very few people are speculating on it losing value. And there's less than 1% of the shares in that float that have been borrowed and sold in a short position. We'll talk about short positions. Of course, fundamentally, we have their earnings uh, per share. And the amount of, of that that is paid out is uh, pretty decent. 77% of their earnings is paid out to the shareholders. Uh, the other part of the earnings is held to do research and development and to grow and to uh, keep reserves and, and things like that. But this tells you that they're, they're able to pay a dividend um, with, only, you know, with, with to spare. They can pay their dividend and have money to spare. If you see a company that's getting their payout ratio close to you know, up in the 90s, that means if they had a downturn in their business, they'd be much less likely to have the room to pay out a full dividend, and the dividend would be at ri a greater risk of shrinking. You get less dividend. Uh, and then finally, the dividend yield is about 3% for a new investor at today's price. Of course, for Buffett, uh, as we saw, it was uh, you know close to 50% because his cost base was just so low. So if you uh, look at Berkshire Hathaway... He's the top owner, and after that, it's Vanguard and BlackRock and you know, all the way down of who holds what. You'll notice that of the, the, the 3.84 in the float, Buffett holds about $400 million of it um, and, and on down. Coca-Cola, I, I, the only reason I use Coke here is as an example. It's very popular. It's a popular brand, and I, I very much struggle to help people understand that this is a real company that you own. Um, Warren Buffett didn't buy this on the inside. He bought common stock and he bought it at prices that anyone else could have bought it at. There was no insider uh, activity here. Uh, certainly he has acquired stocks as an insider. You know, banks, for example, that he had warrants on. That's certainly an insider deal. But his, his top company, other than Apple, and even Apple he bought at retail, um, he's a common stock owner. He's been buying common stocks for a long, long time. And uh, over a billion, uh, uh, to almost two billion drinks, you know, cans of whatever, DeSante water, Coke, Sprite, you know, whatever else, Fanta, <laughs> you know, that's just an amazing business to, to be a part of. Uh, that's tremendous power. What if these guys raised their prices by one penny? You know, what would happen? The amount of money they can command uh, they raise their prices by a penny. You know, I don't think too many people are switching to Pepsi. And so they have tremendous power. And they have tremendous reach. Uh, it's a very solid company. You can see why Buffett would want to own it. So the first position you could take is a long position. And that's really what this particular segment is about, long positions. And the long position might be for cash flow. You might say, I want to take a long position and try to reduce my cost basis or or at least as the stock grows and the dividend grows you know my cost will remain the same and i want to increase my cash flow by getting a dividend very few people see the power in this very few people have the patience for it uh in the get quick rich quick get rich quick now remember buffett is an octogenarian so are you willing to wait until you're an octogenarian to enjoy what he enjoys people hail him as the greatest investor of all time, which I believe is true. I'm in that camp. The question is, are you willing to wait till you're 80 to enjoy those, 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 uh, benefits as he did. So he was very patient and uh, very smart. He did not diversify, did not get into 401k. He didn't buy mutual funds. He bought stocks that pay dividends. And as the stock price grew and the dividends grew, his cost base has stay, stayed the same. So his dividend has, has grown to, into a significant cash flow hundreds of millions of billions of dollars in dividends that this guy has collected so uh 
that that's it. So let's talk a little bit about dividends. If you want to take a long position, uh, I would say that the, the most important pillar there is going to be that fundamental analysis to make sure this company as it stands today is strong. Now, Buffett has gotten rid of companies, but Buffett has sold. When the fundamentals no longer provide the best opportunity for him to grow, uh, and, you know, it would take a lot for a company to be more attractive than Coca-Cola. His cost basis is so low and his dividend he receives from that is so high that to sell those shares off, to go buy something else, uh, you know, it'd have to be pretty darn attractive. And so the fundamentals become very, very important here. So there's a little website here and it, I'm not recommending one side over the other. I'm just saying here's one that has... Uh, dividend information, dividend.com, but there's other places you can get this. And it talks about the dividend yield. So right here, it's 2.92% as of this uh, conversation. They're paying out $1.60. They pay out about 77% of their, of, of their uh, stuff, and they've had a dividend growth for over 56 years. They've had good growth, so pretty good track record there. Um, you know, there, there's their daily snapshot and their range today. But this is what we're really going to speak about. And these are important things to understand if a person's going to collect dividends. Here's uh, four or five, or here's four dates uh, and uh, some amounts and some types to look at. The first date we're going to highlight down here is the declared date. So on July 18th of 2009, right here, it's a little faded, so it's hard to see. The board of directors said we are going to pay out a 40 cent dividend. So that's where that amount comes from. So every quarter, the board of directors decides, you know, what, what the payout's going to be. So here for this quarter is 40 cents times four is a dollar 60. So that's important. 40 cents right here over the month, which is a dollar 60 over the year. Well, if you bought the stock for three bucks, that's a pretty good payout, right? If you bought it for three bucks, like Warren Buffett did. If you bought it for $53, it's about a 2% gain. So it just depends on what price you bought it at. Um, if you bought it cheap, 40 cents is a lot. You know, $1.60 is a lot. The ex-dividend date. Now, this is important. What the ex-dividend date is, is this is the date in which you would not get a dividend. So a person, this is very important, a person has to buy one business day before the record date. Notice this, there's a business day difference. This uh, re record date is 916, the ex dividend is 913. So that's over a weekend. So this is a Friday and this would be a Monday, right? And so there's a, a business day. So you have to have this two days before, okay? Two days before. If you try to buy this, okay, on the ex dividend date, you will not get the dividend. You would have to buy this before the ex-dividend date, which is two days before the record date. If you buy it two days before this record date, before this ex-dividend date, you will be what's called a shareholder of record, where you'll be recorded as someone who owns the stock and is entitled to this 40 cents. Now, what's interesting is someone's going to ask, well, could I sell the stock uh, right after uh, this record date and still get my dividend? The answer is yes. Technically, you only need to own this stock for two days to get a dividend out of it. So some people say, well, wait a minute. Why don't I just look at everybody's dividend days and just get that dividend every two days, you know, for 15 times during the month on 50 different stocks and get rich. Slow down there, tiger. Hold your horses there, brother. Relax there. Don't you think other people might have thought of that? <laughs> You know, every time someone gets a new insight, you have to think, gee, uh, the market's been around a long time. Maybe someone else has thought of that before me. What happens is, is if this is a company, whoop, and here we have Coke, and this 40 cents, right, gets paid out as an expense to dividend holders, now the value of this company dropped 40 cents. Well, times all the shareholders... Uh, that'd be 40 cents a share. So it would make sense that on this ex-dividend date, you might see Coca-Cola drop 40 cents a share. Why? Because the company got 40 cents a share less valuable. And so that's very, very common. Now, it doesn't happen every time because there's other factors. Maybe there's some good news or you know an upward market where more people bought where it doesn't drop that 40 cents. 
But just know that that it makes sense that the value of the company would drop 40 cents because their bank account dropped 40 cents a share, right? That makes sense. So just know that that if a person were to buy it here and plan to sell it, it might be 40 cents cheaper uh, on the date that's recorded on Monday. So just remember, the strategy really is to own this company, to live with some fluctuations in stock price, as long as there's not fluctuations in, that are too severe fundamentally. That's a real key to Benjamin Graham and Warren Buffett type investing. Is say, look, I'm not really going to concentrate on my stock price. I'm not going to look at that a lot. But that doesn't mean, and please understand, that doesn't mean I'm going to hold the stock until I die. I will mind my business. I will mind my business. I will look at my fundamentals and I will see if I no longer want to be a shareholder. Uh, Buffett has divested out of businesses, not because the price was falling, but because the fundamentals made him less optimistic about the company's future. So it isn't like the, the dogma is, the dogma is not buy a stock and hold it till you die. It is buy a stock with the idea of being a business owner and collecting earnings. If the fundamentals threaten those earnings and threaten that growth and threaten the future of that business and say, hey, this isn't looking too good, then, I, then I'm going to sell. You know, we spoke about Kraft Heinz earlier and Buffett said, you know what, we made a mistake, we overpaid for it, but I still like the dividend, I still like the basic business, and I still like the fundamentals. So the fact that it went down, you know, 40% in stock price doesn't bother him at all because he's got that first pillar of fundamental analysis. He understands the technical analysis. And as he looks at the technicals, that's not a threat to him. He sees that thing drop. He's fine with it. Why? Because he feels the fundamentals of that business. Now, as of this recording, uh, he still owns it. And to be quite honest, I own some. But if those fundamentals change, he might not own it. And I might not own it a year from now. It depends. But we're not making decisions based on stock price any more than a real estate investor would forego and sell off uh, a property uh, because of a, of a housing mix. Look, as long as you're cash flowing, uh, you're fine, right? You're, the cash flow is coming in. This, uh, this dividend is a nice dividend. It's not what they paid before. They were up at 66 before, but it's still a nice dividend relative to what you paid for. Hey, maybe the rent goes down a little bit, but as long as it's cash flowing, I'll keep that house. So again, this is not buy and hold until you die, no matter what it all costs. If you do that, you'd be holding companies like Enron and you know US Robotics and other companies that just went down and down and were perfect uh, companies that just, just died. So it's a fundamentals idea over here. Uh, of course, the pay date is when you actually get paid. So they announced the dividend in uh, uh, in in July. The ex dividend date, meaning, hey, here's where the dividend is, and uh, you if you didn't own it before this date, then you're out of luck. And then there's the record date uh, where you got on the stock two days before this business days, and then they they pay you. Now, this is a payout type. Several kinds of um, payouts. Uh, we'll just talk about two. There's three or four, but let's talk about two. They pay you in cash, which is a regular one, or they could do what's called a stock dividend where they could pay you in an increase of shares. They might give you a couple more shares. This one and most pay out in cash. So that's a little bit about dividends, and I think they're underrated. Uh, if I would have learned about dividends years and years ago, uh, when I first, uh, I mean, this is something that should have been taught in high school. You know, you saw it on the Monopoly board, but didn't understand it. And I really wish I would have understood infinite return, cost basis, uh, low cost basis, because dividends are a fabulous source of income. Uh, very, very solid. Another thing we want to talk briefly, and I'll leave it up to Tom Wilwright to expand on this and your own tax advisors, but also people that say, well, I'm just going to you know, buy the stock before the ex-dividend date. I'm going to sell the stock you know, right after the record date just to get that 40 cents. You know, Hey, if I'm getting 2% on my money and I can do that you know, 15 times a month, that's awesome, right? I, I, I you know, rock and roll it because you know, 3% in two days on your money, that's pretty good, right? There's a temptation for people to think that way. Well, 
if you buy and sell the stock and you do it that quickly, this is going to be taxed as or, or this is going to be taxed as ordinary income. So let's say you're a dollar sixty, uh, you know, or or for, let's just call it forty cents, right? Forty cents. Well, what if you're in what if you're in a thirty percent tax bracket, right? Well, how much of that money is going to get eaten up in taxes? Well, thirty percent of it will. So ten percent is four cents. Twenty percent is eight cents and 30 percent would be 12 cents so you'd be down to 28 cents after taxes but guess what your stock price would go down most likely 40 cents not guaranteed but 40 cents so if the stock price goes down 40 cents and you only keep get to keep 28 of that 40 pulled out it's a losing game so the idea of being a trader rather than an investor when you buy stock for a dividend has its perils uh, doesn't work very often now we said that there was two types there was intelligent investing and there's also unintelligent investing there's intelligent speculation as we saw and unintelligent speculation so let's talk about intelligent speculation if you do feel you'd like to get a gain you know you have you have growth stocks that do not pay a dividend and yet buffett owns some of these Holy cow, really? Yeah, absolutely. He's got some that do not pay a dividend currently. And uh, he might hope that they, they may someday. But, uh, but, but right now, some of them don't. Some of the big holders he has. So he's thinking, hey, I'm, either someday they will pay a dividend, which is most likely his belief, like Apple didn't always pay a dividend. Um, now it does. So... What we look for, and I'll talk about patterns in a minute. Here we have an uptrend, right? We have some uh, resistance that now could become support. Maybe we've got a doji here. We have all this technical analysis. So we want to use both pillars here, fundamentals and technicals. If we think this is going up, we would like good fundamentals, right? We'd also like a good uptrend and good technicals. So we talked about a lot of that in the technical analysis pillar. That's where you'd use those skills. Um, when we open a position long, we're speculating. We're hoping to buy low and sell high. When we do this, to do this more intelligently, is many people do this unintelligently, where they simply just buy it and hope, and that's it. And they feel, you know, they went and shopping at Home Depot. It was crowded, so they said, well, let's just buy it and see what happens. Um, here's five points to identify to do this more intelligently. Number one is the entry point. We'd want to make sure stock the stock fits certain criteria, and there'd be many criteria to choose from. You know, a bullish broad market trend would be nice. Strength in the sector would be nice. Strong fundamentals would be nice. Technical indicators such as a MACD is crossed, or or some other type of indicator, a Bollinger Band, whatever you're, you 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 like. A bullish price pattern like an ascending triangle we spoke about. This is just a bit of a bullish retracement right here is, would be this pattern, right? This pattern would be an uptrend with a bullish retracement where the old resistance has become support. We think it's got a chance to take off like it did here and here. Well, it's got a chance to do it again. Um, we like candle patterns. Maybe it came back and there's a doji here. Or maybe there's a bullish engulfing uh, candle here, right? We get confirmation on the top. Uh, a good reward to risk ratio, and maybe we want the dividend too. You know, it would, wouldn't hurt if it had an attractive dividend and paid it. You know, over the, if the ex-dividend is over the next couple of weeks, maybe we get a dividend out of it too. And so that's nice. So you have the entry that you put yourself in. So that's the first of the five is what is my entry? And you'd write down here, well, the entry is $100. That would be the, the, uh, the, the entry point. Okay, next is a realistic target. To just say, hey, this is going to go to a million dollars is unintelligent. But it's more intelligent to say, hmm, you know, this has had a run here that much, a run here that much. To have one equally as high isn't guaranteed, but it certainly has been proven. I really like the idea of, of uh, giving it a chance to only do things it's done before. When I coached, or when I was playing basketball in college, I had a great coach, Rick Majerus, and he, I never saw him draw a play up in the huddle. Never saw him draw one up in the huddle. What he would draw in the huddle is plays we already had run. 
In other words, he didn't invent new stuff in the huddle. He didn't listen. He didn't try to make us do something we haven't done before. Let me say that again. He didn't try to make us do something we haven't done before. It, it, there was even no guarantee that we could do it right that time, right? But if he pulled out his clipboard and drew a play, it was a review of one that was already practiced and performed many times in practice or in a game where he knew we at least had done it before, where he you know, wasn't hoping we'd do something new. I think that's intelligent coaching, and I think that could be intelligent investing. to Say, look, I'm not going to expect this as my target because the stock's never done that before. We want to find something that the stock has done many, 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 many times, which is this. So here we have a $20 gain. Here we have a $20 gain. Here we have a $20 gain. It would not be front page news to have this stock make a $20 gain, right? It would be front page news to have it go $50 without a pullback, right? And so we like to see things that it's done before and set a target that, that, that has a shot, you know, that's likely to be achieved. Um, not guaranteed ever, but, but likely to be achieved, okay? And, uh, and so we have an entry. We also have a, a target, and, we, and then we have an exit. And this is very important for speculators because if you're going to speculate and you're going to play around with this, um, we cannot, we, we, we do not want to risk um, you know, our money speculating. We don't want to risk a bunch of it. So we're going to put an exit in there. And this is very important because we want to invest intelligently or trade intelligently, not emotionally. In other words, in both in, in, in Graham's book, that book is as much about temperament as intelligence. Um, when, when someone says I'm investing intelligently, it almost, uh, you can almost hear it saying not emotionally, right? I'm going to invest with the temperament of numbers, not, uh, emotions. And so this gets set in stone and a per, an investor says, look, I will accept emotionally either outcome. I'm okay with losing $10 here. I will not freak out. Uh, $10 here isn't going to affect my portfolio. It's not going to affect my life. And I'm okay with losing $10 and I'm okay with making 20. I will not exclaim if I uh, make 20 and I will not exclaim if I lose 10. It's simply a re -risk, reward risk ratio, which is the last two numbers is I want to know how much my reward is, reward is, which is 20 in this case, and it's uh, a $10 loss. So I'd have a reward to risk ratio of 20, whoop, 20 on the upside and 10 on the downside. Now, it doesn't always work out this way, but what if we thought of it this way? Let's say that uh, we trade 10 times and we're right 50% of the time. And it doesn't always work out this way because sometimes it meanders in the middle. But if we say, okay, we'd make ten, we trade 10 times, and on the five that we are correct on, um, we get $20. So 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. So that's $100 to the upside that we made. And we shouldn't exclaim, but we did right there. Then on the downside, we have 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. So on a coin flip, if it moves, it could stay in the middle. But on a coin flip, um, you make 100 here and you'd lose 50 here. So your resulting would be a $50 uh, profit, right? $50 to the upside. Now, that's, that's oversimplified, okay? Very oversimplified. What it does do, though, is it speaks to the power of a risk-to-reward ratio slightly, right? Often, often it will meander and you'll have what's called a time stop. Um, but the idea of having more reward um, in my plan that I'm allowing to have and risk. And we'll talk about moving up the exit and doing some of this in the risk management section and in that pillar. But I will tell you, it's, it's, it's almost impossible for me to talk about reward without risk. They're so intertwined that even in introducing this, we have to do a little bit of the fourth pillar of risk management by drawing a line in the sand. So if you're going to be a stock trader and speculate a little bit and have a little bit of fun um, in addition to your base investing, and we're going to tr be a trader right here, which is fun to do, uh, we do not put in a target without an exit. We just don't do it. 
And once this goes down, you can't, you're not allowed to change your mind and say, well, I hope it comes back up and let it go further. You're, you're out. So that's a more intelligent way. There's more things we can do. Certainly. Um, you know, you look at different, different technical patterns. Here's some time, here's some places where, uh, I might be, uh, prone to speculate rather than to just invest and look for a dividend. Um, and that's not to say it'd be right for you. Everyone's different. This is education. One of the things that I really, really, really like are gap downs. And I, I love these because the market's very emotional. You know, Warren Buffett said, be fearful when people are greedy and be greedy when people are fearful. So a lot of people would say, oh my gosh, you know, look at this thing. It just lost $40 from 220 to 180 this is a horrible, you know, thing. Let's run for the hills. This is bad news. It's on fire. And they see with that as a negative thing. Uh, to me, I see that as a positive thing because to me, it looks like it's on sale. So, uh, you know, imagine if people on, uh, and, and they, you know, the commentary in the intelligent investor talks about this. And you know, what if the guy on CNBC said, awesome news, you know, here we have stock ABC. Okay. This is actually a different stock, to tell you the truth. It's called Facebook, but hey. And uh, here we have a company maybe that just has this catastrophic uh, downturn. Well, you know, what I have to do as an intelligent investor, and what you will do, is you'll say, okay, great. Something did happen, uh, and obviously this is emotions. This is obviously emotional uh, because they freaked out, and it's down you know, $40. That's a huge amount of money that was just lost right there. So I have to ask a, a question. First of all, why did it stop right there? Why didn't it fall to 160, 150, 140, 130? So from a technical standpoint, I know that the reason it stopped here, that it didn't gap down to here, down to here, down to, you know, $50, why? Right? right? Why did it gap down to 180 instead of 160 or 140 or 100? You know, why did it stop right there? Well, I'll tell you why. People started to buy it. So for a technical reason, I say, all right, that's about where the market says they think it's worth uh, the risk again, right? Then we think it's worth buying, you know, the market maker took it down, 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 and all of a sudden people started to buy it right here. So from a technical standpoint, I know that people started buying it. Now, could it go down from here? Yes, it could. So what am I going to do? I'm going to look at my fundamental analysis. I'm going to say, look, why did this go down? Well, in the case of this stock, uh, there, there were some things that came out that uh, they said, look, we're watching and collecting more of your data on Facebook than uh, maybe you would have liked. And people got upset with that. And, and so they said, you know what? Uh, we're going to sell the stock. But my question isn't whether they were happy about it. My question is, are they going to quit using Facebook? And, they, and are people going to quit buying Facebook ads? And my answer in my mind was no. And so we call this filling the gap. Fill the gap. So what would you have? Well, I would have an entry right here, right? Maybe just above and make it say, look, if it starts heading up, I might put my entry in right here, right? If it starts heading up, that's a good direction, right? I might put my target right here. Why? Well, I'm choosing a place where it's been before. You know, it, it was up there before. Think of it like a family fight. You know, you maybe you get in an argument with your mom or your dad and you say bad things and they say bad things to you or whatever happens. Or maybe you and your spouse have a tiff and, you know, the, the value of that relationship goes down for a day or two. But you know what? You kiss and make up and you get back to normal. What we're really looking for is when this falls is, is this a fundamental flaw or an emotional technical move? Um... You know, you look at Kraft Heinz as it got down. Uh, Buffett didn't sell. He didn't flinch. I don't know that he bought more. I did uh, because I thought, you know what? This is good news. They're getting sued. Another great example of this is Johnson & Johnson. Is Johnson & Johnson, uh, I think it was the state of Kentucky, said, hey, we think you're responsible for you know all these deaths and cancers because of how you market. And uh, so when that lawsuit was announced, I was, oh, my gosh, we're in trouble. 
And, you know, the verdict hadn't even come out yet. It's just because of a lawsuit. Their sales didn't change. Their, their marketing didn't change. Nothing changed. A lawsuit. You don't even know what's going to happen. And yet, oh, my gosh, we got to, the, the stock's down, stock's down. I says, my gosh, that could be on sale. And sure enough, they slapped their hands with like $400 million to a company like Johnson Johnson. That's jump, well, it's not jump change, but it's recoverable. They're going to recover from that. They get their lawsuit taken care of, and well, now you can go sell Q-tips again, right? Or whatever it is they sell, you know, Band-Aids, gauze pads, whatever they sell. And so when you have a gap down, the question is, is what's the likelihood of, it, of filling that gap? Remember how we talked about buying things closer to zero with the concept of infinite return? The closer your initial investment gets to zero, the better. That's a lot closer to zero than 220. So filling the gap is one of my favorite things to look at because it de designates tremendous emotion. And uh, now we have to figure out fundamentally. Now, in the case of a company like GameStop, which we've been using for an example, <laughs> those gap towns, <laughs> you know, those are that's when their earnings came out. They said, look, we're not making any money anymore. And by the way, our forecast is that we'll make even less. And why? Well, you know, Apple's got the game cloud now. And, uh, you know, Google's going to, you know, Microsoft, if it, luckily they had a little good news in that the, the gaming consoles are still going to be made with discs for this next round of Sony PlayStation. But I'll tell you, the next round of Sony PlayStation, this is akin to my Sony Walkman that used to have a cassette tape in it. And I would swap out cassette tapes to my f iPhone that just has, you know, how many hours of music on it now. And so when I see that gap down representing a fundamental flaw in pillar number one, well, I'm less optimistic they can fill the gap. So this is what we talk about non-emotional investing and the intelligent investor. You know, is this an opportunity uh, to buy? Well, we do that by looking at the, the fundamentals of the business. It might just create the best PE ratio you ever saw. If the earnings stayed the same, remember, we have price over earnings. So if the price drops and the earnings stays the same, I get, remember, it's a jack in the box, right? It's a jack in the box. And the jack in the box spits out a dollar every year, right? Well, if the earnings are $1 and all of a sudden this jack in the box used to be $220, but now the jack in the box is only 180, this is a deal now because the amount of money you're you're getting doesn't change, doesn't change. So, those four pillars are huge. Fundamental analysis matters. Uh the people who say, "Oh, it's all technicals." Well, if you're a high frequency trader, and by the way, a high frequency trader, algorithmic trader, that gap that wasn't good for them, was it, at all? Uh, so there you go. This is called so that's called filling the gap. So what we're just attempting to do is take two or three examples of bridging a technical pattern, right? Which is called a gap down, a technical pattern, with an entry point, you know, to as, as an opportunity. Right here we have an ascending triangle. And my entry point here might be if it breaks out because it struggled to break above this line. Let, let's see, it struggled here, it struggled here, it struggled here, it struggled here. Whoop. Let's get back on there and it struggled here. So five times it's tried to break that ceiling. Well, if it does break through, there's a real chance that it could go. Maybe you take a low and a high like this distance here. Say, so, you know what, it could do that again, or maybe even this low to high. Again, we're not expecting it to do something that it has never done before. So, you know, 40 to 55, that's a $15 deal. Maybe I can set a target, you know, somewhere in this area. So I say, look, I'll enter if it breaks above. Why is that important technically? Well, they've said no here. They said no here, they said no here, they said no here, and they said no as recently as last week. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make them say yes and prove to me that they finally changed their mind. Now what's interesting is they said yes here, and then they said yes a little higher, and then they said yes a little higher, and then they said yes a little higher. So pretty, there's this battle going on, right, between how far will they let it fall? They would not let it fall as far as it did before. And they would not let it fall as far as they did before, right? We have this ascending support. We have this ceiling that's solid. So it looks like there's pressure building to the upside. 
So I say, you know what, I'll put my entry just above here. If this is 50 and this is 55, you know, maybe this is 5250. So maybe I say, look, I'll buy at 53. I'll make them break out and I'll go $10 up maybe and say, hey, I'll, uh, I'll set a target of maybe, uh, you know, maybe 60, maybe 65, something like that. Okay, something like that. Now, let's talk about the exit, and I, I forgot to do it here. There's a couple of different ways to do an exit, and, and you'll fall into, you know, people really, it's, it's funny because people want a recipe. They, want, they love dogma. People love to go to church and say, look, here's the rules. Here's what's true. You do this, you'll go to heaven. Here's the rules, right? And that's what people would love to have in every area of their life. Here's the rules. If you follow them, you're going to go to heaven. Uh, here's the recipe. You bake these Mrs. Fields cookies come out, right? Follow the recipe, you get a result. And that law of the harvest is really true in a lot of cases. Not so in investing. There's a lot of different ways you can do something, a lot of different ways to skin the cat, so to speak. I don't know why you'd want to skin a cat, but that's the same. So when we look at this right here, how do I know where to put it? Well, number one, I could do a risk reward ratio. If I say, look, two to one. If I'm willing to try to get $40 here, maybe I'll risk 10 or 20, you know, so I have a risk reward show that is greater than two to one, right? Two to one or greater is what we're looking for. You could do it that way. You could also find some old technical point where it gapped up here. And isn't that interesting that, that it found a gap to a place where resistance became support see that that happens over and over and over again it'll fall down to a place where resistance gave support well maybe i follow the next support and i put it down here and i say look that's my new support so i give it if i'm going to try and make 40 maybe i make it broad with 20. but another way to do it so you could use just the general risk reward and say hey it's risk reward that's it is what it is i'm going to play my percentages or you could find a, a spot of support right? And if it broke through support, oh, I don't want to be in it now. They've changed their mind worse. Or you could use this, which is called the average true range. And this happens to be one of my favorites. Right here, it looks like it's about, oh, $7, six or $7 right here, where the average true range is right now. So maybe I say, look, I put my target up here, back up here at 220. Here's my target at 220. And I say, I'll put a stop loss under of $7. So I have 20 on my upside, uh, or excuse me, $40 upside and $7 downside. I'll take that risk. And you can see why I would do that. I'd say, gosh, you know, if I get in at 180 and it's headed up and it goes to 40, I'm thrilled with that. And if I only lose seven, well, you know, I had a chance at 40, cost me seven, I can live with it. Unemotional. If I lose the seven, I shrug my shoulder and say, well, you know what? I had a chance at 40. Why not? That's more intelligent speculation than unintelligent speculation, right? Because I have, it, what's intelligent speculation? Non-emotional speculation. The, the, the interesting about Graham's book and others is that the intelligent investor is about investing without emotion. And this is about speculating without emotion, right? Both require intelligence and both require a temperament that is actually similar um, in that we don't get emotional about things. Okay. Here, obviously I might use a previous candle low. If I get in here, if it pops up, I might use a previous day's candle low that ATR. I could even do this, which is popular because you know, the, this average true range means that it could have a $7 wiggle room on average. Well, if I times that by 1.5, let's say, which would be what seven plus, uh, uh, 350, which would be uh, 1050, right? If I made it 1050, that would give me a little margin to keep from whipsaw. The problem with the stop loss is when you put it in, it goes out, gets you out, and then it goes up without you, right? Let me say that again. Let's say my target's here, it hits it, goes down, gets me out, and then it recovers without me. So we want to have a little bit of margin there. So three different exits. We'll talk more about this, review it again in the, in the risk management pillar. But I would feel remiss if I said, hey, here's how we buy a stock without having a way out. We always want a lifeboat if we get on a Titanic, um, for sure. So we could do um, just basic risk reward ratio. I look at what we, my reward is and I make my risk to reward ratio two to one, right? I could do that one. 
Number two, I could use some technical analysis. I could find, I could use the previous day's low of support, right? And, and give a little wiggle room there. Or I could just as easily find a real major level of support here and say, that's it. As long as my risk reward ratio is great. Or I could use an average true range, which is my favorite. One and a half, two times the ATR equals my exit price. And as long as I maintain a good risk reward ratio, any of those are appropriate. Again, understand the mentality of the investor is not that of the employee. Okay. An employee says, look, 40 hours of work, what do we get paid? Not a penny more, not a penny less. That's what I want. Give me 40 hours of work, give me a pay. They want this false security. Now, they could also get laid off, right? And that freaks people out. That's one of the worst experiences a person can have. An investor doesn't feel that way. They, they try to strengthen their spirit as much as they can. And they try to realize, look, it's not the end of the world. I had something bad happen to me. I'm what's called resilient. And uh, think about that gift. If you're resilient, and what a great attribute. You know, resilience means that bad things can happen to me, and I can bounce back. And I have a faith in my own resiliency to know that I can make myself a better world. I can, whatever, whatever life throws at me, you know, I can be resilient. Look at key rows of mine like Stephen Hawking. That guy lost everything at 20 years old. And yet, look at what he accomplished and what he did. Helen Keller. These people are resilient. Um, if, they, if, if Stephen Hawking can do it with a slow form of this horrible ALS that took forever, and, and he lived a great life, and Helen Keller had most of her senses gone, and she had a, a very successful life, well, you and I can be resilient if we lose a couple bucks in the stock market, right? But the idea of wanting the perfect formula every time, and it just doesn't matter. There's so many factors that as long as your risk-reward ratio is there, uh, and as long as your position size is there, you should be all right in doing a little bit of speculation, if you want to, if you want to. So this is a gap pattern. This is an ascending triangle pattern. Um, and this one right here is just a basic uptrend, right? And this one isn't perfect, because what I'd really like to see is see this old resistance right here you know i'd like that to be the support down here here we have to go back a couple to line that up so it's not a perfect one but it'd be acceptable and again i'd probably wait for it to come down to bounce off here i probably want to take it so this would be a watch lister and i'd probably take it down to bounce and then i put in an entry if it headed up my target would be where where it's hit before right my, my entry would be there my target would be here and my exit would be, um, you know, one and a half ATR. Here it's it uh, looks like about two, so little, yeah, about two right here. If this is zero and this is two point five, this is probably about two dollars. So three dollars, one and a half times whoop, one point five times the ATR is a great exit. If you didn't catch all this exit stuff, don't worry. We're going to cover it all over again in the fourth pillar of uh, risk management. But I did think it was important to take a minute and start to string together the four pillars, right? I mean, here we had fundamental analysis saying, look, it's still a fundamentally sound company. They're not going out of business because of this. Okay, technical showed a gap down, right? And then we had a little risk management, and we decided to go along with our position. So those are kind of fun uh, to learn. The best way to learn this is uh, to begin here. And then to watch us practice this in the weekly mentor club. Uh, there's probably a greater than 50% chance if you're watching this that you're already in the mentor club. Uh, almost uh, half the people that do four pillars also say, yeah, I want to do mentor club. In fact, more than half. And so there's a greater than 50% chance you're already there. If you're not in mentor club yet, uh, go find a, a webinar or write us an email about what it's about because that's an immersion experience where we do this uh, with stocks, you know, this is, uh, I'll, you know, I say it's ABC. I'll tell you what stock this actually is. It's Facebook. This happened a while back, but we were actually trading it in the Mentor Club when this happened, right? So you can see how we react in real time. Well, you know, this is ancient history now. This is an old gap. Well, there'll still be gaps in the future, you know, you know stocks gap down. And uh, in the Mentor Club, you'll see it done for live. So a little plug there for the Mentor Club. Um, that's a little bit about going long, right? So when we go long, we have two ways, uh, two mentalities. Let me see if I can find this. 
two mentalities when we decide to own a stock. That's what a long position is. When I say I'm long, it means I ownership. Let me uh, take away the idea that that always means bullishness. Yes, most of the time it does. You know, long, I'm bullish, short, I'm bearish. Most of the time that's true, but not all the time. So in my class, the healthy way, the smartest way to understand what a long position is is say, look, I'm putting something here and I own it. I'm putting something here and I own it. Well, why would I want to own a stock? Two reasons. I can get cash flow from the dividend. I can also buy low and sell high if I want to speculate a little bit, right, and do a little trading. Both need to be done as intelligent investors, not as emotional people. They must be done. And so you can see that we have criteria for both, um, a temperament for both. And uh, that's a little bit of a beginner's lesson, certainly not comprehensive, but a beginner's lesson on what a long position is. So what is a long position? It's when I decide to own something. If I own real estate, I'm long real estate. If, I'm, if I own stock, I'm long stock. If I own gold, I'm long gold. Anything I own, that is what we call a long position. Long position is about the things that you own. So great job um, on this first position of, of going long. We can talk more about uh, using margin at a later time. For example, if I want to do this and the stock is $100, it really only costs me 50 because I'll have uh, the other 50 paid for by the brokerage. So you can use margin with this position. But for right now, let's just keep it simple. If I own it, I'm long. If I own it, I'm long. Whether I used margin to own it or in real estate, if I use a bank to own it, you still own it. Uh, if you own it, you're long. Great, great job. When we come back, we're going to talk about one of my favorite things to do, uh, which is much more risky, going short when we come back. Great job.